Hi everybody, Physics Ninja. In today's video, we're going to look at calculating the magnetic fields uh, from a charging capacitor. And I'm gonna do that using uh, this concept called a displacement current. Now, you, we may uh, have some experience at this point calculating magnetic fields produced by real currents, charges flowing through wires, and for example, like the case I show you here on the side. Now, if I have a current flowing in a direction, I could calculate now the magnetic field produced by that current using either Biot-Savard or possibly using Ampere's law if I consider a really long wire or if I'm really close to it. All right, you may be used to using this uh, case. Now, what happens if I give you this circuit over here? Let's imagine this circuit. So it's just a simple RC circuit. We have a battery that has some uh, voltage across it. I have a resistor and a an, an capacitor that is initially uncharged. And I have a switch that is open right now. So if I close that switch, this is what happens. I am going to start to charge up that capacitor and produce a voltage across it. Uh, at the beginning, when you first close the switch, there is a large amount of current that is produced, and eventually that current decays all the way to zero. In the bottom figure over there, I'm showing you what the charge across that top plate looks like and what the current looks like as a function of time, just giving you some sketches. Now, what happens now? Let's zoom into that capacitor and look what happens when I'm starting to build up the charge on, that, uh, on those plates. So if I zoom into it, this is what it starts to look like. Initially, I have no charge on the plates. And after some time, again, I'm uh, taking away electrons from one plate, adding them to the other plate. And that means that we have charges that are opposite and they're equal to each other. And those produce an electric field that points from the positive to the negative. And since the charge is changing as a function of time, the electric field is also changing between the plates as a function of time. So what happens now if I produce a loop inside and I want to calculate a field, right? How would I calculate? I can calculate the electric field. That's a very straightforward, and we're going to have to do that to calculate the magnetic field. But I don't have any real currents that are enclosed here by this loop that I've drawn here. So if you were going to apply our standard Ampere's law, well, I wouldn't have a real current that is enclosed, right? However, I do have something else that is happening that is going through my loop. I am changing the electric field inside that loop. And what we're going to have to do in this video here is in order to calculate that magnetic field, I'm going to have to use the full form of Ampere's law. And it's an Ampere's law that includes another term. And that second term here is called Maxwell's modification. It is written as mu zero, epsilon zero, and d phi over dt. Now mu zero and epsilon zero are just the regular constants we've been used to um, so far in electricity and magnetism. So the uh, permittivity of free space for epsilon zero and the permeability of free space for mu naught. Now the new term is the d phi over dt. And I put a little subscript e here uh, just to indicate that this is a changing electric flux. So changing electric fluxes with time are going to produce magnetic fields. And that's the concept we're going to use today to calculate uh, our field inside that capacitor region. All right, so uh, this term phi E is nothing more than an electric flux, uh, very similar to the magnetic flux you may have seen before. And if I group together the epsilon zero with the d phi dt, this is something called the displacement current. Okay, I'll refer to this as ID and we can use it to calculate the magnetic field. All right, so in this video, we're going to look at two cases. I'm first going to consider the case where I'm inside the parallel plate region. So I'm at a distance R from the center of the axis over here, from the center of that capacitor. And that little distance R is smaller than the plate radius in this case. All right, that's the first case I'm going to consider. I want to know how the magnetic field changes as I move away from that center axis. Uh, in the second case, I'm going to consider the case now when I'm outside that region. All right, how do I calculate the magnetic field outside using this modified Ampere's law? All right, like with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to Physics Ninja. It's the best way to support what I do. All right, let's get started. 
All right, so uh, here we have our first case here. We're looking at the case where our distance from the center is less than uh, the radius of this uh, plate of the capacitor right here. Uh, we're going to apply our modified uh, Ampere's law that includes this uh, Maxwell correction term. And the first thing we notice is if I place a loop here inside uh, this plate region is I have no real current that is enclosed. So this term here goes to zero. Now we'll worry about the left hand side in just a second. What I now want to look at here is what is this electric flux term right here? All right, the electric flux, the definition of it, again, uh, in this case, the field inside this capacitor is constant. So if the field is constant, I can write the flux as being uh, the field multiplied by the area um, inside this uh, dashed line multiplied by cos of the angle over here. All right, now for this case, the electric field we know goes from positive to negative, and the area, a vector associated with that area, is also going to be uh, in this perpendicular direction, perpendicular to the plate, which means that the field and the area vector are parallel to each other. So again, you don't have to worry about this angle theta. The angle theta right here is theta equals to zero. So that leads that our electric flux then is simply the field multiplied by uh, the area. And the area that we're looking at here is, I'm just gonna explicitly write it out, is pi r squared, okay? It's really the area of the loop. All right, now how do you write the electric field? Well, if you remember for a uh, capacitor, if the capacitor has a charge density, which I can write as sigma, okay? Um, the electric field produced by two parallel plates like this is given by this. It's the charge density divided by epsilon zero. Okay, that's my electric field. And now I multiply by that area of the loop, and this is what I'm left with. Now this, keep in mind that this charge density right here is simply the total charge on that plate divided by the total area here. This is the area of the plate, not the area of uh, inside my loop over here. So that's very, very important. So let's substitute this into our flux formula right here. So we get the total charge at any specific time divided by the area of the plate. And then I still have my epsilon zero right here. So that's the electric field equation. And now I have the area of the loop. All right, my last thing I'm going to do now is I'm gonna note that the area of the plate, I can substitute that because I know that value. The area of the plate is pi, it's big R squared, right? Keep in mind, you have the big R because it's the total area of the plate that goes in there, divided by epsilon zero and then multiplied by this area of uh, my small loop. Now you can uh, clean this up a little bit, you can get rid of this, you can get rid of this. So my final expression here for that electric flux, uh, phi sub E is going to be written like this. I'm gonna write this as R squared over big R squared. I have my epsilon zero that I'm gonna to bring to the front. And all we're left with then is proportional to the charge at any instant in time. So this is an important equation. Now what we're interested in though, at least for my Ampere's law up here, is I'm interested in how this flux changes with time. So really what the quantity that we're really interested in is this, d phi over dt. Well, all these other terms here are constant terms, so they don't change with time. So forget about those, leave those in the front. And here I'm left with dq over dt. Well, guess what this is, right? dq over dt is actually the definition of our current, real current, right? What is the rate at which charge is changing as this capacitor is charging? So you can write this last expression there as r squared, epsilon zero, big R squared multiplied by that current. All right, so now we're ready to substitute this back into our Ampere's law with that Maxwellian correction right here. But now we're gonna worry about the other side of our Ampere's law, this guy. Now, if you've solved problems with Ampere's law before, again, this is a, a top-down view down below, okay? If you look at it from the top down, you can see the electric field is going into the page right here. And again, uh, the magnetic field is going to go around this circle here as shown. So how do you evaluate this left-hand side of Ampere's law? It's always the standard operating procedure. 
The field is going to be constant in magnitude everywhere around this loop. And then you have to multiply by the total length of that loop, and that's simply the circumference, which is 2 pi little r. All right, so now we're going to put the left-hand side equal to the right-hand side. I'm going to add all these other terms that were here. All right, and now I substitute the d phi over dt. I'm left with this, epsilon 0, r squared multiplied by that current. Now notice you can uh, get rid of one of the epsilon zeros over here. And we get our final expression for this magnetic field is given by this. It's mu zero uh, multiplied by, again, there's going to be an r that's going to cancel out. Let me just get rid of this right now. Uh, mu zero, I'll write it like this, multiplied by current divided by 2 pi big R squared, and I'm still left with one other term here. I can't forget this last R, which is this term over here. And this expression is valid as long as R is less than or equal to the radius of uh, that plate. Now, one thing we notice is that this is linear with the distance away from the center. Okay, that means that right at the center, there is no magnetic field. And the biggest magnetic field I'm going to get is when little r actually equals to the radius of that plate. That's when little r equals to big R, and that you're going to get the maximum value right here. All right, so this is our expression for uh, case one. Let's now have a look at uh, case two for this problem. All right, so we're going to start with case two. That's when the radius little r is bigger than the radius of this plate. And again, um, this term here is zero. I'm not enclosing any real current. So let's start off by looking at the electric flux over here. The electric flux, phi e, I can write it as the electric field multiplied. Now let's think about the area, okay? The flux here is basically only uh, contained where that electric field is, and that is the region between the plates. What we're going to do here is we're going to neglect any small fringing field here I'm going to say that that is only going to contribute a small amount to this changing uh, electric field. So we're not going to include that. So the area that I'm interested in here is really the area of the plate here, because that is the only region where we have an electric field. So again, the electric field, you can substitute it now as being um, the charge density on the plates divided by epsilon zero. And the area of the plate now, so this is one of the differences, is pi big R squared. Again, I make the usual substitution for that charge density. I can write it as the total charge on the plate and divided by the area of the plate, which is also pi r squared. And again, epsilon zero. And here you still have the pi r squared. Now you notice that we have all of those terms are equal to each other. So you can cancel those out. So that means that my electric flux is simply proportional to the charge on the plates. Okay, well, that's kind of useful. But again, now in my Ampere's law, what I'm interested in is how is um, the electric flux changing with time? All right, that is d phi e over dt. And the only thing changing here is um, the charge, right? So that is dq over dt. And I still have my 1 over epsilon 0 right here. All right, uh, the term dq over dt is nothing more than the current divided by epsilon zero is what we have left for our electric flux. So we can go back now to my Ampere's law and substitute this onto the right-hand side. Uh, the left-hand side for this problem looks exactly like it always does for objects with this cylindrical symmetry, is you have a field here around this loop multiplied by the circumference, which is two pi little r, and this equals to mu zero, and the rest is nothing more than the displacement current. This term here in the bracket is the displacement current ID, uh, and then you just substitute our value. So we have epsilon zero, and here you have the current divided by epsilon zero. Uh, we get those epsilon zeros that cancel out, and look at this expression right here, that our magnetic field when we're on the outside of the plates, this expression should look really familiar to you, this is mu zero multiplied by the current at that specific time divided by two pi r. And this is the value that's valid when r is bigger than the radius. This here looks exactly like the field produced by a wire, right? When I'm on, when I have a current over here and I'm a certain 
distance away from the center of that wire, this is exactly the same expression that we get. Right, so it's kind of interesting that you get the same field. So the wire, um, let me just write same field. So let's now look at kind of the sketch of what the field looks like as a function of distance and wrap this up. All right, so these are the two cases I looked at here. We had the case when little r was less than the radius of the plate, and I had a linear relationship here with the distance. And the case when I'm outside of the plates, that's when little r is bigger than big r, it just looks like the field produced by a wire. Now I can sketch both of those here. If I sketch them, uh, the plot should look like this. I have a linear region here, so a straight line all the way until I reach uh, the radius of the plate. And then as I'm going farther away from the plates, I have something that varies as uh, one over R, right? Proportional to one over R. And in this case here, it's proportional to the radius. Uh, you can calculate the maximum value, just set R equal to big R, and you're gonna get, use any of those expressions and you'll get the final answer. Now, one thing to uh, keep in mind about these uh, two relationships, you only get a magnetic field when there is a current. And remember when that is, you only get a current here when we are actually charging the plates here. Once the plate is fully charged, there is no more current. Remember the current in an RC circuit decays exponentially. So out here, there would be very little field because guess what? There is very little current over here. You get the maximum right at the beginning and then that field starts to go down with time. So that is a very, very important thing to remember. We only have a magnetic field when we have a current. All right, folks, that's it for me. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.